Hello and uh, thank you so much for watching. My name is Chris Cook and I will be discussing the Dick and Carey design model. Uh, the Dick and Carey design model was originally proposed in 1978 uh, as part of the larger text, the Systematic Design of Instruction. Uh, the authors uh, are, of course, Dick and Carey. Uh, sometimes the model is referred to as the Dick, Carey, and Carey model. Um, and this model is also referred to as the systems approach model in some cases. Um, the model is known for its focus on the interrelationships between design elements. So it is this kind of iterative model that has uh, sort of built in feedback loops um, that allow the designer to kind of go back and uh, modify instructional elements or kind of redesign uh, the instructional system as a whole in order to better uh, meet the needs of the learners. Um, as far as applications go, this model can be used in almost any setting. Um, so education, uh, K through 12, and in higher ed, we see this model applied and used. Uh, it's also used in corporate, government, military spheres, uh, and I'd also add nonprofits to the list here. Um, so it's a pretty general model. Uh, there were some kind of indications that um, the applications were different, depended upon the field or the setting. So in education, uh, there were some suggestions made by folks who had used the model um, in my research uh, that suggested that the model was used in more small scale projects. Um, so kind of used to design units, uh, individual units or multiple units, modules um, to be applied to lesson plans. Uh, and in the corporate kind of government, military, and maybe nonprofit worlds, um, the model was used for larger scale projects, um, which would be kind of developing a whole course or a training program. Although I think that, you know, most likely the uh, this model can also be used for large scale projects within education, particularly if we're talking about professional development. Um, so kind of training, you know, folks that are, are already working within that field. Um, and probably uh, could be used for small scale projects within the corporate, uh, government, and military world. So here is a flowchart that um, is showing you the way that the Dick uh, and Carey model kind of operates. Uh, I'm going to go through each step individually here and explain them and also demonstrate the kind of focus on interrelationships and the iterative nature of the model itself. So um, the first uh, kind of step in the model or the starting point is to identify instructional goals. Um, so uh, the um, identification of instructional goals as well as the instructional analysis and the, en and the um, identification of entry behaviors, these are all part of uh, the front-end analysis within the Dick and Carey model. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and just unpack these uh, very briefly. So um, the first step, identifying instructional goals, involves uh, kind of stating or identifying the skills, knowledge, and attitudes that uh, learners will be expected to acquire through the instructional intervention or the training. Um, the next step would be to move on to an instructional analysis. Now, uh, an instructional analysis uh, is going to involve um, really uh, kind of nailing down or identifying the skills, specific skills that the learner will need to acquire. This can be done uh, by conducting a task analysis. Uh, this would be one way to do it where you would um, identify a skill and list all of the uh, steps necessary to acquire that skill. Um, the next uh, step, um, of course, these uh, two steps, instructional analysis and the identification of entry behaviors are kind of interchangeable and they both feed into, as you see here, the um, production of performance objectives. Uh, but the next step would be to 
um, analyze the learners and their contexts. So in this step, we're actually looking at um, those who will be exposed to the instructional intervention, uh, the learners, and we're uh, thinking about the skills, the knowledge um, that these learners bring into uh, the, the training program or the instructional intervention, and also thinking about the context within which the learners exist. Um, so uh, this is a, a kind of key component of the Dick and Carey model because it does consider um, the context of the learner and uh, really, you know, considers the, the specific uh, kind of needs um, and, uh, of course, also pre-existing skills that uh, learners have. Once the front-end analysis has been uh, conducted, the next step is to start uh, writing performance objectives. So this is where uh, instructional goals are translated into specific objectives. Um, so in higher ed, this might look like the kind of uh, learning outcome statements um, that, uh, you know, say things like students should be able to. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, after the after that statement, you would have a specific objective that a student would be required to achieve uh, or should be um, able to achieve after being um, exposed to the instructional intervention. Uh, the next piece is to move on to uh, the development of criterion reference tests. This could also um, just be referred to as the development of assessment instruments. So this is where um, the designer would start thinking about ways to assess uh, the performance objectives that were written previously. So, for example, if I were, you know, designing a course um, for faculty to learn uh, more about and um, eventually successfully produce uh, accessible Word documents, fully accessible Word documents, uh, of course, my performance objective would be um, faculty will produce uh, Word documents that meet um, accessibility guidelines. Uh, the criterion referenced test or the assessment tool might be an accessibility checker. Um, so, of course, Canvas, if you're familiar with Canvas, I think most of us are because we're using it in this course, um, has accessibility checkers if you are a designer, and uh, those could be used to evaluate um, a, a faculty submission uh, of a document to test for accessibility. <clears throat> the next step uh, after developing assessment tools is to uh, start thinking about instructional strategy. So instructional strategy refers to um, the uh, types of instructional activities that relate to the accomplishment of learning objectives, uh, per performance objectives. Uh, so, if, for example, we might, um, you know, define the type of modality. Are we going to use face-to-face -face instruction? Are we going to have hybrid instruction? So, virtual, part, partly virtual, partly face-to-face, -face, fully online. Is it self-paced? Is it asynchronous? Is it synchronous online? Um, you know, this is where you would kind of define the uh, uh, delivery method um, of the uh, instruction itself, as well as to start thinking about other strategies that might come into play. Um, uh, next, uh, in, the next step is to develop and select instructional materials. Um, so uh, the instructional materials are a bit more specific than the strategies. Um, so instructional materials here would be would involve the selection of uh, media that will be used in instruction. Uh, it might include, uh, uh, you know, specific types of um, uh, assessment tools that will be used by the instructor. Um, you know, really any kind of uh, materials or tools that will be used by learners or uh, instructors uh, or designers if they happen to be um, leading instruction. In, as well. Um, so the instructional materials could be pre-existing or uh, they could be developed by the designer or uh, instructor, subject matter expert, um, or both. Uh, the next step would involve conducting a formative evaluation. So um, 
A formative evaluation is meant to determine how to improve the instruction uh, that was delivered um, or is, is being delivered. Um, so formative evaluations actually could be occurring throughout this process, hence the iterative nature. Uh, and then we you know, could actually move back to revisions uh, and then kind of start the process all over again. So formative evaluations can be conducted anywhere um, in this process and can be used to improve uh, the instruction, improve the design, um, and hopefully produce um, you know, results that meet the performance objectives um, from learners. So uh, examples of formative evaluations might include uh, interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews. Uh, they might include focus groups. They might be kind of more informal, just the uh, instructor or designer, um, you know, kind of uh, reading the uh, reading the room, so to speak, or um, you know, really using their kind of intuition and knowledge of design and instruction to, um, to 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 decide what types of modifications to make to the design or instruction, um, or they could be more formal, uh, like um, uh, surveys um, or, or something like that, uh, to gauge um, perceptions of learners. Finally, the uh, last step is going to be to develop and conduct a summative evaluation. So summative evaluations are definitely more formal. Uh, summative evaluations might be uh, some kind of standardized test. Uh, they might be an, an actual um, uh, a, a demo of a, a performance um, or a, a behavior or a skill that the training program is meant to um, is meant to teach. Uh, and so, um, you know, summative evaluations are meant to gauge the effectiveness of the program as a whole. Um, so these are meant to uh, really kind of tell the designer or reveal to the designer or instructor whether or not the instructional intervention that they've um, produced is, is successful and is, is doing what it's meant to do. Uh, now, you know, the last piece here that's not really shown on this model is the revision process. Um, so it's kind of captured in this uh, arrow going back to the identification of entry behaviors or the, the learner analysis. Um, so, uh, you know, revision is a key part uh, in the Dick and Carey model. And after um, summative evaluations have been completed, the next step is to, of course, revise instruction uh, for future learners and uh, hopefully to, you know, improve the, um, the instructional intervention or the, the, the program itself. Okay, so next I want to talk about the advantages of uh, the Dick and Carey model. Um, so this model is, uh, has, has many advantages. Um, it's a, a systematic model that focuses on the skills learners will acquire from instruction. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's pretty clear in its focus on, um, uh, on, on learners meeting performance objectives, on gaining the skills that the instruction is intended to uh, produce. Uh, it's designed for replication. Um, so, it, you know, it's systematic. Uh, it's meant to be replicated. Um, this means that it could be kind of scaled on an institutional level or throughout an organization and could be delivered by, um, you know, various uh, stakeholders, um, not necessarily those who produce the program. Uh, it's applicable to almost any content, so it's very general. It could apply to a chemistry course in higher ed, or it could apply to a um, you know, training program in a uh, international NGO, um, and, and, and almost anything in between. Um, so it, it definitely has a generalizable, generalizable uh, kind of aspect to it. Um, it's a, uh, a holistic model in that it focuses on the whole design process and the connections between each component. So as opposed to just focusing on kind of individual or isolated aspects of um, instruction, it focuses on the whole process um, and takes into account the relationships between the various components. Uh, it also breaks complex instruction into smaller pieces. This is also maybe one of its disadvantages, uh, which I'll get to on the next slide. Um, the model has been criticized for being time-consuming, resource-intensive, so if you're trying to create something on the fly, 
um, like say this teach back activity, uh, then you know the Dick and Carry model might not be uh, advisable. It's um, it, it you know it's it, it, it's quite systematic and uh, it's um, it definitely requires time uh, in order to engage the process effectively. Uh, it's a linear process um, like Addy. It's similar to Addy. It's an expansion of Addy. Um, and this is one of its criticisms: is that you know it's it's maybe too linear, uh, and learning might not be linear in the way that the model is uh, constructed, um, at least for some. And um, it's also been criticized for having too many steps. Um, so it's an expansion of Addy. Uh, this you know this model can be um, between nine and eleven steps. I, seen different variations of the model. Uh, Addy model is usually uh, the five steps. So it's, um, you know, it, it might be a bit more complex. Uh, it's rigid and there is maybe not a whole lot of room for error. Um, so the, the model has been, you know, criticized for its uh, kind of lack of flexibility. Uh, references are here and thank you so much for watching.